Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session. My name is Jim Snabe, and I am what I call a concerned optimist. I am an optimist because I fundamentally believe that through many of the technological advancements, we have an opportunity to reinvent society, the way we do business, in ways that are significantly more sustainable. And I am concerned because I do see that we live in a crisis of confidence in many ways, um, where some of the fundamental systems, even maybe capitalism, is being challenged. And this session is about exactly that. How do we regain trust in business? How do we regain a compact between business and society? In many ways, the theme today is uh, core to the whole theme of Davos this year, the responsible uh, responsive and responsible leadership, and we'll talk about what business leaders can do. We won't blame it on the politicians. We'll talk about what business leaders can do in restoring that compact. We will talk about one of the key challenges in business, how to balance the short and the long term, and of course, we'll talk about the role of business, not just in business, but in society. Most of all, we'll talk about the role of leadership, and for that I have a very strong panel of strong leaders who all have demonstrated not just a commitment to the leadership around the long term, but also are acting that way in the way they run their businesses. We have in our panel Ms. Lupna from Olian Financing Company. We have Mr. Naka Nishisan from Hitachi, Japan. We have Franz von Houten from Philips, and we have Dominic Barton from McKinsey. And of course, we have the many leaders in this room. I hope that this session can inspire us all to take on a significant longer term and responsible leadership, even if we feel that's already what we're doing. To frame the problem, Winston Churchill once said that the price of greatness is responsibility. And in many ways, business has improved conditions in society over many, many years. We've doubled the life expectancy over 200 years. We have lifted millions of people out of poverty, and yet we have this crisis of confidence right now. We have a climate change phenomenon that is, to some extent, caused by business. And we saw a breakdown on the business side, on the financial systems in 2008. We came to this Davos with an intent to revitalize the relationship between business leadership and society. And we did that by suggesting participants to sign a compact, a compact for responsive and responsible leadership. And one of the driving forces behind this initiative was actually Franz von Houten from Philips. And I'd love to maybe start with a brief conversation about what led to that and, and, and why was that such an important topic in your mind as a global leader today? Thanks, Jim. Um, indeed, uh, uh, the International Business Council of the World Economic Forum had a deep discussion back in August uh, around responsive and responsible leadership. And if you take a, a wider context, um, society at large is still grappling with a lot of challenges. I, on the one hand, has made tremendous progress. Hundreds of millions of people have come out of poverty over the last years. But, you know, climate change, there's still uh, disease issues. Um, we have this fast-changing age of the Internet. And uh, people uh, feel that maybe they may lose their job because of all the changes that are going on. Um, so they uh, are worried. So it, it's a bit of a conundrum where you can say the world is actually richer than before. You could even argue that on many measures, better off than before. And at the same time, you see a lot of anxiety in the world because there are unresolved problems um, where um, answers may not be available yet. Um, and where uh, people also then lose trust in their leaders. Uh, we see the populism coming up, short-termism abounds. Um, that is not just applying to companies. You could say it applies to politicians as well. Um, but in the end, the discussion we had in August said that's not going to solve the problems. I mean, to hatch an egg, it needs to incubate, right? To have real breakthrough solutions, 
we need to have a consistent north star that we pursue and that we work on and that in order to get to real innovations. Innovations in technology, but also innovations in society. And so we said we, we, we really need to rally around uh, a multi-stakeholder approach in how to do business. We as leaders need to take our accountability of what we can do uh, to contribute to a better place. And in that context, uh, we realize that we have a lot to offer. Um, many companies can actually contribute to some of the challenges. Uh, we, we recognize the challenges are fantastically worded in the Sustainable Development Goals as formulated by the United Nations, uh, the 17. Uh, we don't need to reinvent what the challenges of the world are. Um, and companies are important and influential actors in society and we can all contribute to that. But it is sometimes at odds with what we call short-termism, where we feel pressured to deliver a uh, shareholder return in the short term, as opposed to creating sustainable value in the longer term and value that is perceived to be value in the eyes of all stakeholders. So we, we, we said we need to um, rally around a compact for responsive and responsible leadership um, anchored around the sustainable development goals, anchored around the notion that we as companies can play our part and contribute. And that is what we, we wrote up and, and that became a simple statement uh, that by now a lot of companies have, have signed up to. And I sense a lot of uh, enthusiasm around it. Um, and I, I hope that this conversation, uh, we can deepen that and also I, I would like um, society to hold companies accountable to that statement. I mean, if we declare that we will contribute to long-term uh, progress in the world and that we take a multi-stakeholder approach, um, then we also need to become more transparent uh, in how we do that. Um, and we should be held accountable. And maybe that can all be part of restoring trust uh, in leaders, which, because we know that that is an issue. But let me pause there. Well, thank you very much. I, I think I would love to spend maybe the first half of this to exploit why are we in this situation. In, in spite of all the progress, and you talked about the fears and so on. When I read the newspaper, it seems like you know the big, big bad guy is globalization. Um, Dominique, what do you think? Yeah, so I'm shaking my head because I, I think I don't think it's globalization. I think globalization did have an effect when China was rising. I think actually China joined the WTO uh, and there were jobs that were certainly taken up by China, but overall, as Fran said, we've had the hundreds of millions taken out of poverty. Uh, but in what I, where I think the biggest issue is actually with technology. Um, and, you know, having, you know, stopping trade is actually gonna be worse uh, than doing anything else. It's technology that we, is the big issue we need to think about. I'm, I'm optimistic about technology, but if you think now about what automation can actually do today, you know, 60% of jobs, 30% of the activities could be automated today. Um, and what that means is that there, th these changes are happening at a much more rapid rate than we've ever experienced before. And so the notion is how do we reskill people? And, and we can't be Luddites, but we, this is where I think business can play a big role because I actually don't think we can rely on government to do it. It's, it's business that will have to play the key role in retraining people. And Andrew Liveris was talking this morning about, you know, when the Model T came out, there wasn't a university on how to build cars. I mean, Ford Motor Company had to figure out how we're gonna train people to do that. Uh, so I think that, I think one of the biggest issues we're gonna have to deal with is how do we deal uh, with rapid technology change and, and job reskilling and, in, and ensuring that people do have jobs and are not, not, uh, not left behind. So if we can't blame uh, the politicians because we're going to take responsibility, we can't blame, blame uh, globalization. Uh, some would argue, and I've been a CEO, that you're driven by these uh, quarterly results. The, the average holding time of an investment in, in the U.S., for example, went down from seven years to now uh, 20 days, and, and some of the uh, machine trading is, you know, seconds. 
is it um, a pressure from the investors? We have a, a great uh, um, long-term investor on stage. Look, now, what is your perspective on this, and, and, and why do we need a compact? Do we need a compact? Well, I would argue we don't need a compact if we have responsible leadership. Um, I, we were discussing it before. I think what we, what we do need, I was saying, we really don't need a compact if we have responsible leadership. What we do need is a compass. And I think every leader, if he is responsible for his company, and if, and if he cares and takes care of his company, and puts the interest of his company before his personal interest, I think the leadership will be in a good place. And if he is not performing the way he should be, then it is the responsibility of the board to take action against that. So I'm not too much in the camp of that we need a compact, but if it helps the society at large, by all means, to go to your question of long term. Yes, we are a family business and the nature of a family business is you are a long term investor. You mentioned it used to be seven years and now it's 20 days. We, we tend to be quite a long term investor that some of our investments is 20 years. And we stick with the, with the company and the management as long as there is transparency, as long as dialogue, as long as everything is, is open and, and you believe in what the company is, is doing. So the issue, I think, of short term is, is really an issue here uh, uh, that is diverting and taking away from the leadership to focus on the long-term strategy and growth of the company. Dominique yesterday was uh, in a session and he was heading at FCLT, focusing capital on long-term growth. And I think Dominique will speak well about it, but it was, it was quite an eye-opener to see that actually there are statistics done. And maybe if you can go ahead and say yeah, some of these. Yeah, the, yeah, we're trying to, it's very difficult, you know, to estimate, we found the, what's the impact of short-termism, the point you made. And we did some work, uh, McKinsey, with, uh, with FCLT Global, and we, we looked at the United States uh, over the last 15 years. And basically, uh, if, you, if you then sort of sum it up in terms of what's the impact on jobs, what's the impact on growth and asset value, it's considerable. It, it, short-termism in the United States over the last decade has cost us 5 million jobs, at least, uh, it has cost us a trillion dollars in asset value, uh, and it's cost us a percentage point of GDP growth. And, and where we don't, so it's a, it has a, the consequences of being short term has a very significant impact on all of us. In that sample of 600 and I think it's 15 companies, there were about 20 percent that are long term, and you do see them creating, you know, 12,000 more jobs on average in their peer group. Uh, than others, they invest 50% more in R&D uh, than, than others. So there is a serious cost to short-termism, as you see, and I think we do need to have investors like Lubna and others who think long-term to ensure that leaders can, in, can do the R&D and build. Uh, uh. So, but let's, let's, let's look at that problem around the unemployment. It seems to me like every time we get technological advancements, we, the first thing we think of is, how do we replace labor with this new technology? And the consequence of that is uh, rapid um, um, destruction of jobs now, more than creation of jobs potentially. Japan has always had a tradition of lifelong employment. And you're also facing, I think, a unique challenge around an aging population. What's the perspective from, from, from Japan on, on the issues and, and the reason for this uh, crisis of confidence we have? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jim. That, uh, I'm responsible for the, uh, the Hitachi, that is a manufacturing industry, and also that the Japan's uh, major uh, business is uh, industry, uh, the manufacturing industry. Right? But now there used to be the uh, manufacturing of the some products, the technology, simply contribute to that of the how to make it like, high quality, high performance, or those kind of things. But uh, already that uh, uh, France and uh, Dominique you pointed out that all of the, you know, that the issues to be solved more complicated than 
how to make it a more product, uh, not a product basis, a more solution oriented approach required. The Japan, you already mentioned, Jim, is a very complicated uh, social issues we have. So the other, from the viewpoint of the business itself, we have to change the mindset, not the technology or product driven to more solution oriented, how to make it uh, possible to do that. That's a very big challenge. Also, globalization affected of the, uh, the complexity is more. So, those kind of the uh, new type of the uh, the manufacturing industry. That's our target. And so the uh, that we, in the case of the Hitachi, we uh, give up uh, give up the some part of the uh, commodity type of business. How to train of the peoples to make it the mindset from the uh, technology driven to more the the social issues to be solved, how to do that. That's a big challenge, but still the, that's the way Japan can be uh, recovered from the, uh, the long term of the recess. Thank you. Jim, uh, yeah. may, uh, may I yeah, yeah, contribute? Um, so, so far we talk about long term versus short termism. Um, I would like to broaden the, the, the challenge a little bit. Uh, if companies are perceived to take advantage of other stakeholders, you get uh, you know, people to be upset. And if you look at pollution, for example, and uh, the air pollution in China, where companies, let's say from a short-term perspective, optimize their results without regard for the impact on the planet, right? That is also an example where, with the compact, we would like to say there is a responsibility mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur in how you do business. Uh, so taking employees along, taking your suppliers along, uh, doing business in a sustainable way so that actually for the generations to come, the environment is still good. Right? So yes, it is about short term versus long term, but it is also about doing business in a sustainable manner, mm -hmm. which you could say equates to being long term. Right? Uh, but I, I think the value system around how you do business is what we are discussing here. And I like what you said, you know, it's about a compass. Right? It is about being able to say, this is how we do business, and you can hold me accountable for being a responsible player. And by the way, that also means that towards my shareholders, I can be clear about how I do business, where I may prioritize a longer term objective versus a you know, short term um, opportunistic uh, sure. advantage. I think it's a great point, but I would, you know, just uh, try and, and challenge ourselves and say, have we been good enough at that? You I look at the climate situation that I we have, so. you look at the inequality in the world that we have, it seems like the, 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 the opportunity that business is driving is, is creating uh, value for few, not for many, and accepting externalities which are negative. Have we been good enough? Is our business leaders part of the problem or the solution? Maybe uh, I would all ask you all, Dominic, what do you think? I, I think it's a matter of we just have to be better. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of factors that are there, but you know, you look at the Edelman numbers, we were talking about it before. I mean, everyone has dropped, uh, everyone, yes. every category, um, and CEOs have dropped. But, uh, but I, I think it's more about we have a responsibility to do better because it's, the world's moving so fast. We, I think what's happened is we've assumed other people will deal with it the government or the educational system or, but it's moving so quickly, it's not being dealt with. And, and that's where I think, I actually think business not only, you know, needs to, because it's a good thing to do, it's the only way we're going to be able to, to do it. And by the way, you can do it and make money at the same time. This is not a, just, it isn't a social thing. This is about the system working. So I, I, I think it's about us having to step up because of the, of the speed and, and other institutions not being able to, to keep up or maybe be ready to deal with it. So, Lubna, you, you said we don't need a compact, a compact. Do we need one anyway? Are we good enough Sorry. in this? No. Uh, I think, we, as Dominic said, we can always do better. And we should do better. It is our duty. It is our responsibility. And we have, in our organization, we have responsibility to all our stakeholders, our employees, their families, and you owe it to them. Each country has its own challenges and, uh, and uh, things to deal with. But within the DNA of the company, within the core values of the company, uh, 
is, is what comes with, you know, from that you get to the mission statement of the company. And I think if you take up from that and uh, your uh, uh, contribution or obligation to society, I think in our parts, my part of the world, we used to rely so much on the government that the government will provide and all of that. And it is now the private sector is realizing they are on an equal footing with the government and that they have to contribute. So we have to contribute on education, on employment, where we have all these uh, challenges. And I think the private sector is getting together and similar to this compass or compact, and seeing what more can we do. We should learn from each other where others have been successful. So I think such dialogue is really important for all of us to see how we can improve. Very good, very good. Any other comments? Yeah. Uh, okay, the basic you know, that, uh, issue for the uh, top management is also that uh, more make it uh, organization or uh, the, uh, the principles simple. That's a very important point. And so at that uh, point, uh, the digitization is a really that a very powerful tool to make it uh, visible and also that uh, how to analyze it. That those kind of things is uh, digitization sometimes uh, negative, po positive, or both uh, view may exist. But uh, the, from the viewpoint of the other, you know, top leaders, how can make it simple? How can make it visible? Those kind of things is a very important approach, not simply of the company management, but also that how to analyze of the social issues. Mm -hmm. The more complicated uh, uh, the issue to be solved in a more simple way. That, that's uh, kind of the, uh, you know, that, uh, the new era of the uh, management view, and so those kind of the how to use of the, uh, utilize of such technology potential, the more the beneficial way. So you're saying we get more transparency and more opportunities, actually. Oh, yeah. Well, I think it's a good conclusion of the first round here that, you know, obviously there are some issues. It's clear that businesses operate in society and they are uh, responsible for more than their shareholders and that we can do much more. I'd like to reverse then to the second part of this because, you know, we can do more is, is rather abstract. And, and maybe use the opportunity, uh, because I know you've all been arguing for more responsive and responsible leadership for a long time, to extract some of your experiences. You know, what have you done? <laughs> and what, what, as, make it as concrete as possible. What have you done? Why was that significant? And, and I would suggest we do a, a full circle on what have you done that changed the way you run your business, and, and why was that important? Dominique, would you start? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think one, as Lubna said, I think it's part of what you should believe in, do, in the work you do, in the communities you live in, you're playing a role. So there's a mindset of people contributing that way. But to be, get more specific to your point, one in topic that particularly concerned us is youth unemployment. And there's been a lot of talk about how to deal with it. And we, and we are part of that talk too. So we said, let's get into action. Yeah. So we basically yeah. made a commitment, a philanthropic commitment to basically invest $75 million to help develop an approach to get unemployed youth into jobs. And we started this a year ago. Uh, we now, and we're doing it in five countries. We're doing it in the United States, we're doing it in Pittsburgh, uh, we're doing it in Mexico City, we're doing it in Nairobi, in Kenya, we're doing it in uh, India, and we're doing it in Spain. And what we're doing is taking high, these people are typically have a high school education and we're giving them training from three weeks to 14 weeks to get jobs. And in the first phase of this, 10,000 of those people now have jobs. Now that's a drop, not even a drop in a drop of the bucket of the 75 million, and we're gonna expand it. But the point is we now have a methodology that works very quickly, very cheaply, and effectively. And now corporations are partnering with us to do it. Uh, to be able to drive it forward. And our, our aim is to take that to a million uh, over the next uh, three years, and we're removing it. And that's not, a, it's not gonna change the world, but I think it, what it is gonna do, I hope, is develop a methodology that we can then scale to other people in, in, uh, in doing it. And it's become an important part of leadership development at McKinsey. If you wanna learn how to be a leader over time, most people leave McKinsey, you better experience that. Because when you do, it's quite a, a mindset change because you're not 
talking about it, you're working, uh, working with it. Thank you. Are you promoting the program to get more sponsors as well? Is that an yeah, opportunity? Yeah, it's called Generation. Uh, Thank you. And it's, uh, and it's, again, not, we want to make it very much not to do with us, but it's called Generation. Uh, it's a website uh, for it. We hired the uh, uh, CEO of CARE to come in and help us run it uh, and drive it properly. But yeah, if Wonderful. anyone's interested in getting involved, please uh, let Wonderful. us know. <laughs> so that's very concrete. Franz. Um, yeah, I'd, I think we should not confuse philanthropy with what we are talking about here. This is, for me, about how you do business on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, Philips is an innovation company, a technology company, and we have repurposed our company to focus on health technology. Uh, basically trying to help uh, meet unmet needs. Innovation company, we need to have a longer term horizon to really innovate and get to breakthroughs. Um, and we have said a portion of our innovation money we will also use to develop uh, methods and solutions for developing markets, not just for the developed market. So we take a balanced view that we said we need to reach a lot of people to improve their lives. In fact, one of our long-term goals is to improve the lives of 3 billion people by the year 2025. Right? So to take a long enough horizon to say how can our technology improve that. Um, another point that I'd like to make is coming back on how you do business. Right? So not only what and what do you deliver. We have embraced uh, sustainability and the circular economy thinking within the way we do business. So we actively uh, pursue uh, having the return path of our products back to Philips. We actively pursue uh, experimenting with business model where we sell a product as a service and where we retain uh, the ownership of the, the assets so that we can optimize the life and also take back uh, the materials. Um, as a company, we have uh, signed uh, the COP21 Paris Agreement to become carbon neutral by 2020. Um, and we encourage all our em employees to be part of society and uh, in, in initiatives to, to contribute, let's say, the knowledge that we have. Um, I believe that because of this, we attract better talent. So it's good for us. Right? Our customers recognize us for uh, this attitude and stance. Um, and I believe that if you explain this well to shareholders, they are perfectly all right with it. Right? So um, we actually say, you know, if you want to invest in Philips, then we are a company that takes a long-term perspective. And that is also what we expect from our shareholders. And we resist, let's say, short-termism in trying to optimize the near term. Thank you. Lubna, will you give a few examples of what you've done? Sure. Uh, well, our company, uh, our founder has always uh, raised the company to be a company that's privately owned, but very, very transparent. We are extremely transparent for all our employees. And so they're always engaged and they're encouraged to think outside the box because that is the only way for us to make our investments. So we encourage dialogue, financial information is always uh, available, and that is precisely what uh, was said earlier, is what helps us to, become, to stay sustainable and to have people come in with uh, uh, ideas and, and intriguing ideas. The other thing is, given where we are, I think one of the pacts and with the great shareholder support, we felt that what is good is to explore and give the opportunity for a, a female population in Saudi Arabia to become engaged. We did it because we felt we're responsible. This is the right thing to do. And so we were one of the first private sector company, the first privately owned companies that employed females in, in, in Saudi Arabia 15 years ago. This has really paid back big times for us. We are very proud of our females, but it really had added productivity to our company and all this. So I think if you think long term, and if, you, if your compass is a long term and you have the direction where you want to go, the leader will only work towards that. And that's the only way for you to grow is to stay sustainable. 
and think of the wider society. The other part of it is, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on the philanthropic, but education for us, given also our part of the world, is one of our main pillars. And education is, is a, so we have to focus on this philanthropic activity because it will pay back to society. And, and that is sort of, so for me, is social responsibility and philanthropy is totally part, an integral part of the business. And they are all together because that's what makes your business sustainable. Thank you. And uh, Naganishi-san, I know uh, Hitachi has done a lot as well uh, in, in, <laughs> in society in general. Well, what is your best example of taking a long-term societal? Yeah, that I already talked about uh, some of the uh, mindset change internally, but uh, simultaneously you mentioned about the uh, that digitization requires some openness, transparent. So the other, this too, uh, you know, that the target is a sometimes uh, not so simple way. Uh, how can get the other very much you know, collaborative work, collaborative creations among the stakeholders, not simply of the others, the stockholders, uh, employees, or customer, but also that uh, all of the social uh, issues is uh, fully related to the society itself. Uh, and so the, uh, those kind of the, uh, the new approach uh, the really the, uh, the necessary to make it uh, happen, uh, such kind of the uh, solution-based uh, business, especially that targeted for the, uh, the very deep uh, social issues like uh, uh, climate change, uh, the environmental issues, energy, or healthcare, you uh, the France already mentioned. Those kind of the, uh, the more complicated uh, task, how to make it uh, more such uh, collaborations uh, is to be uh, possible. Th that's a big challenge. And also, some part, we did it. So that uh, right now, that we are getting the, the, some of the, uh, uh, the very deep trust from the customer side. Thank you. I'd like to prepare the audience maybe for, for a few comments, either challenging uh, the panel here. Um, I'll just take one question so you uh, prepare yourself. Uh, Franz, you mentioned the SDGs, and I think for the first time in history we have a common language of what are the issues and, and how do you potentially measure whether we are progressing or not. Many countries have made plans. Are they well enough integrated in strategy in, in, in corporate world? Where, where, where are we? And, and could we do much more? And then please well, uh, prepare right. yourself for some questions. There, there are 17 SDGs. I'm wearing the SDG badge here, 17 colors representing those goals. I, I don't think any individual company can contribute to all of them. I mean, in, in fact, Philips contributes to three. But I, you know it's three. I know it's three. So we you have studied have... it and we said, how do we take this into our way of doing business? Right. Um, and it, you know, it, uh, it helps us also to focus and to get to breakthroughs and um, to be purposeful. And I think we, uh, we should also be held accountable. Maybe on that word accountable, um, uh, let's say as we promote and advocate for this compact for, for many of us to sign, and I hope you will, um, there, there should also come a mechanism to make it transparent. I mean, have you signed? Are you committed to this? But also, what are you doing, right? And um, so transparency in progress. And uh, For example, Philips, we will um, put this on our website. Uh, also an assessment as to do we live up to this compact. And I've already heard from uh, Reuters Thompson that they, they, they plan to develop a measurement mechanism to kind of you measure you up right, to say, okay, you're say, you, you say that you want to live up to this compact, but are you doing it? And I think then we are building um, really something uh, that, that, again, is sustainable. So I'm very excited about that. Very good. I'd love to get some uh, thoughts and, and reflections from the audience. You may challenge us. Uh, I see one in the first row here, uh, actually two. Um, so if we could get the microphones, please. Uh, identify yourself and then uh, ask your question or comment. Thank you. Yes, my name is Ayman Tamer, chairman of Tamer Group from Saudi Arabia. I couldn't agree with the panel a lot, uh, Hans and uh, Lubna. I just wanted to mention that we need to, I believe we need to reinforce more purpose versus reward in doing business. And going through our transformation today, using digitization in order to optimize and be efficient, we're losing our values. 
and I believe reinstating values and engaging employees in these <coughs> values genuinely is key to having a sustainable business. On the comment of long term versus short term, I don't believe in a dichotomy. I think you need to achieve your daily short term goals yeah. to achieve your long term goals. Yeah. And if your short term goals contradict with your long term goals, then they are not sustainable. So I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah. My question is, we need in this compact to reinforce more and more our values yeah. in our business. Yeah. So basically, you bring us back to the importance of purpose, the values in the companies to be the driver because of the compact and yeah. one reflections one from the panel. On the people don't Please, anyone in particular? Or? Yes, people don't work for what you pay them. They work for the purpose and the belief in the company's purpose. Yeah. So I, I really couldn't agree more about reasons. So we are a violent agreement. I mean, we, we had a deep soul searching a few years ago. You know, what is Philips here for? No, a 125-year-old company. Uh, why would we be here again in uh, the years in the future? How will you sustain? In fact, the average lifespan of a company on the Standard & Poor's Index has, has diminished now to less than 18 years. So it is not obvious to stay relevant in society. Right? And uh, short-termism will certainly not keep you relevant. So we had this soul searching to say, OK, in our genes, we are an innovation company. And what should innovation companies do? They should solve problems. Right? So we said, what is our purpose? Well, our purpose is to make the world healthier. So as a technology company, we will you know, focus on uh, improving patient lives and people's lives. And you know, it, it, it attracts people because the millennials of this time and age, they want to work for companies that have purpose. And I think if we want to restore trust between leaders and the people and the society, we need to talk about purpose. Moreover, our deeds, our actions should demonstrate that we do that because the Edelman trust barometer that was presented yesterday actually say words don't count, right? Communication will become upside down. It is going to be people judging you on what you do, right? So uh, our actions need to speak uh, volumes. But thank you for endorsing the compact, and I hope you will sign it. So, second question from the front, and then we have one uh, just behind there on the third row. Yes. Mark Vernoy, uh, partner at Think School of Creative Leadership. My question for the panel is, as leaders and as responsive and responsible leaders, what skills and mindsets and capabilities do you try and install in the leaders inside your organizations to build them as those responsive and responsible leaders for the future? Great question. Without that, it's hard, right? Anyone with that experience? Dominic? Yeah. Um, first of all, I think it's this notion at the outset, it comes back to the purpose point that we're, you know, we're here for a, pr a purpose. Every organization's different. And I, I actually go back, I've said this many times, so if, forgive me if I'm boring you, Adam Smith's f was statement in the, his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, it's the duty of the entrepreneur to take care of the society in which they operate. And then he talks about purpose, right? And so there's a first notion of we're here to try and work on some of the most important problems in the world. That's kind of a note. So there's a, there's a, right when you come in, there's a mission of what we're, we're trying to do. And you can pick any which way you want. The second element is that you actually see the world. Because it's very easy for us to be in an ivory tower, to be removed, to be doing analysis and seeing it. And that's why I think it's absolutely critical that people get exposure to working where the different where the conditions are are different and not talking amongst ourselves but talking with factory workers or people that are unemployed or and so forth so giving people those experiences uh, to be able to do it working in different countries in different environments so it very much has to be part of the a l broader sense of what leadership is and that broader sense is is a is again thinking about your role in society not just about yourself thank you a question there Hi, my name is Otto Lampe. I used to be in charge of uh, coordinating the German Global Compact Network, which was founded in 99 and uh, also subscribes in one of its principles to the principle of corporate responsibility. So I would just like to know, since it wasn't mentioned, uh, to which extent are there synergies, to which extent do you intend to cooperate with the Global Compact Network? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, was that a comment or a question? Um, 
I could not completely hear the question, but I, if I try to understand it, you said, how do we collaborate with other organizations that have, may have similar About the compact values? With, with the global compact that was yeah. founded by Kofi yeah. Annan in 1999 here in Davos. Yeah, 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 no. Actually, last time uh, Klaus Schwab asked people to sign a compact was exactly that compact. It was a compact around uh, um, workers' conditions, um, uh, climate change, um, right. Um, and, and uh, human rights, as, as far as I remember. And we're basically um, building on, on top of that. What we'll do as a forum is we'll bring a website where we can not just debate this and discuss this, but also bring best practices and try to integrate other compacts that are out there so we don't have this mess of compacts, but a, a, an acceleration, a, we become a catalyst for the change that we have in mind. So that's what we'll do, and as, as the forum is, is not trying to define but be a platform for, we'll be very open in that process, and, and Franz will continue his lead with this. We'll discuss the compact today with uh, roughly 100 CEOs as well, and hopefully get their full support as well. Um, I think this leads towards an end. Time is ticking. I am uh, confident that in a world of uh, scarce resources, time is probably the most scarce that we have. Um, I don't want us to leave just with a great conversation. I, it would be great if we all could do two things, uh, consider signing the compact, uh, but also get maybe one advice uh, from each of the panelists on what could you do differently um, that could maybe inspire you as you leave this room and take on the, the lead for a more sustainable future. Um, Dominique, would you start? Sure. And I, I say this because everyone has their own business. I think what Lubna said and Franz said is you have to do something that's in, I think, context of your business or location rather than a broad thing. So I'm coming at it from that angle. And I, I think that there, I would look at the education system, skilling system. What could you do to fundamentally change that, improve it, to enable more people to participate in a rapidly changing place? Education and, and reskilling. Thank you. Franz? Well, first of all, I'd like to call on everybody to, to, to download the compact, read it, and hopefully sign it. Um, but I think behind uh, such a, a signatory uh, would be a process where you engage with your stakeholders, with, with your own board, uh, with your management teams, with your employees, and actually uh, have a reflection on um, the role of the company, of your organization, um, in this fast-changing world, because that is what we need. Responsive and responsible leadership means that we all take our share. So my wish for, for that for today is that we, uh, we all commit to that. Thank you very much. Lubna? I think if I am, uh, this session made me, as I said earlier, reflect on the definition of responsible leader. And uh, uh, for me, a responsible leader is the one who puts the entity he's serving with uh, ahead of his own personal interest. And in the long term, I think everyone will become a winner in that, including that individual. And, uh, and I think a responsible leader is one that leads by example. So that's what I'd like to leave with. That's a good advice. Makanishi-san? Yes, uh, the, all of today's discussions, uh, sustainability is the, the total goal for us. But now the uh, it uh, diversified the uh, issues included, but now the, uh, I would like to recommend of the, uh, all our leaders, uh, even in uh, internal leaders, the sustainability is one of the uh, focusing on the very important goal. Well, but thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the Chinese leader yesterday said that um, the right thing is to see every opportunity and face every challenge. I think it starts with the commitment. We are urging everyone to look at the compact, as Franz said, and sign it. Um, we have copies in, in, in Davos, and uh, if you don't want to send it, you can go to the chairman's office and hand it in. I'm sure Klaus will be excited about that. Um, that is to create visibility around the uh, commitment from business leaders to take responsibility and not leave all of the issues to policy or point fingers. I think that is a very important thing. Of course, visibility is not, not enough. It's about the, the action. It's about the leadership. And um, 
even if we are arguing that the long-termness is what we have in mind, I believe we need to act swiftly with short-term actions. And the one thing that stuck out, if I should summarize from today, is that the urgency around upskilling and reskilling for a digital future is probably the one most urgent that we all should care about. It takes probably 10 to 20 years to redirect an education system. So I think actions on all levels, um, policy as well as business, to solve that. We made a report in the World Economic Forum that we have five years to solve the skill gap problem. Otherwise, we'll have less opportunities. So with that in mind, a, a wise um, uh, man, actually a, um, one of my mentors said, when you make decisions, always think of your children and your grandchildren. With that in mind, thank you very much for joining us and for your commitment. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated for the upcoming session.